Good evening. Welcome everyone to tonight's event, The Sexiest Man Alive, The Male Sex Symbol, Masculinity in Popular Culture, uh, presented by Westminster Libraries in conjunction with Kensington Libraries. Some of you will have heard John Mercer last year talking about Rock Hudson, and if you did, you know you're in for a real treat. If you didn't, you're still in for a treat. Um, John is a professor of gender and sexuality at um, Birmingham City University. His works include pornography, representations of masculinity and sexuality, um, sexualities and celebrity studies. Um, he's the editor of a series called Masculinity, Sex and Popular Culture. So as you can see, his career has basically been leading up to tonight when he's going to give us the definitive answer to who is the sexiest man alive. Um, just a little housekeeping. If you look at the top right of your screen, you'll see a little chat bubble and you'll be able to post in comments and questions there. Um, we obviously at the end, John, I think, has talk for about 40 minutes and then there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So over to you, John. Thanks, Nikki. Hello, everybody. So as Nikki's already told you, I'm John Mercer. I'm Professor of Gender and Sexuality. And with Clarissa Smith, I run an AHRC research network that is called Masculinity, Sex and Popular Culture. So the talk I'm giving you today is based on an essay that I wrote, I was surprised to see uh, seven years ago now, but uh, some of the ideas in this essay are ideas that I'm using for a book that me and Clarissa are writing at the moment. So please expect this talk to be accompanied by acres of rippling flesh. Please expect it to be extremely gratuitous. And please ask yourself why looking at men in this kind of way still makes people uncomfortable in 2021. This is a library talk and because it's a library talk, I'm going to try and point you to some interesting readings as we progress too. So readings that you, you may well be able to find in your local library. So let's start off with some of the ideas that I want to um, try and engage with. I think the first thing to say is that sex symbols are important. So the, al although this is a, a light-hearted talk, um, the, the debates that I'm trying to engage with within this talk are not trivial concerns at all. I think the idea that sex symbol is a way into understanding cultural values is kind of quite a useful one. And I think what sex symbols reveal is that we don't move from a repressive past to a progressive and liberal present. There are in fact attitudes to sex and sexuality are actually quite complicated and far more polymorphous than that. Um, that in fact, sexuality is a bit of a conundrum at all moments, including now. And one of the reasons to do this kind of research, for me at least, is to kind of to, to attempt to challenge orthodox thoughts about masculine ideals as being fixed and singular and shifting to argue that masculinity, in fact, is far more complicated, far more fluid, just as sexual desire is also complicated, fluid and ambiguous. So male sex symbols are not just static and consistent in how they look and what they represent. And that's really what I want to kind of um, to argue today, that there's an enigma around male sex symbols. So we need to start off with terms of reference. The idea of the male, um, I'm sorry, the idea of the sex symbol is almost always associated with women. And the specific term, as far as anyone can agree, and as far as I have been able to um, determine, the, the term was first used in the 1950s, and in particular in relation to Marilyn Monroe in popular accounts of her, uh, her success and her stardom. In the case of um, the term sex symbol then, it's a term that is used to describe a post-war context, 1950s um, American society in Hollywood cinema, and a context in which sex and sexuality seem resurgent, that, that sex is really back on the agenda in the 1950s. Now, the reason these kind of things matter to me, the reason uh, thinking through 
what what's hiding in the term sex symbol is because most of the work that I do is really focused on thinking about how certain types of language that seem to reflect really uncomplicated ideas have loads of contradictions and complexity and ambiguity hiding in them. So today I'm going to try and make the case that male sex symbols have existed for as long as, if not predate female sex symbols. I'm going to try and argue that the first sex symbols were in fact men, even if the terms that are used to describe them were different terms. So the term the matinee idol or the Latin lover, I'm arguing today is equivalent to the term sex symbol. I'm going to try and look at some specific moments when the idea of what we might call a male sex symbol comes to the fore. Now, I, I should say at this point, this is in no way is meant to be a comprehensive history. What I'm trying to do is, here is think through what the idea of sex symbol means in a specific moment. And lying underneath this, of course, is thinking through Whose sex are we talking about when we're talking about sex in the sex symbol? And I don't think that's an insignificant question. So words matter to me a lot. And here's the first reading recommendation I've got to you. Um, this is kind of a bit of an old fashioned book. And uh, there's a section in this book that deals with um, a discussion of gay men and gay male language that I think is really quite problematic. But I think it's an interesting read nonetheless. Um, it attempts to tell us where the term sex symbol originates. It didn't really tell me anything I didn't know already, but I found this quite an interesting book and I think some of you at least might as well. So let's move on to thinking about sex symbols. You'll recognise this image or these two images. They relate to a vignette that is part of the iconography of the Bond franchise. And this vignette, this scene, this moment has been used to mark differences in the sexual and gender politics of the films at specific points. So in the first film in Doctor No, we have Ursula Andress emerging from the sea like Venus arriving on a, um, a conch shell, not a conch shell, on a shell. Um, and she arrives at the beach, emerges from the sea while uh, Sean Connery's bond is hiding behind a bush, staring at her in Dr. No in 1962. Um, much later on, here's Halle Berry, marketed as the first black Bond girl, again emerging from the surf while Bond observes her at a beachside bar in Die Another Day. By the way, although Halle Berry was marketed as the first black Bond girl, and you know there are a whole set of problematic questions about why, why that would, uh, why, why that language would be used to describe her in the first case, she actually wasn't. Uh, Trina Parks in uh, Diamonds of Forever in 1961 is usually identified by Bond historians as the first uh, black Bond girl. Cast, though uncredited, as a character called Thumper. In both cases, what we're seeing here is Bond looking at the Bond girl. We know why he's looking at her. We know she's presented for us to look at through Bond's eyes. The world feels like a fairly secure place. So let's jump forward to Casino Royale in 2006, another bomb reboot and another moment where this vignette is repurposed. So what I'd like you to do is just watch this and try and notice the exchange of glances in this sequence and think about who's looking at who at this specific moment.
Can you not? Um, hi, John. Can yeah. I interrupt? So it just stuck with the horse riding, so you might want to try again. Right. Let's have another go. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, everybody. The um, the excitement of seeing Daniel Craig in his swimming trunks off obviously made my computer break, but hope hopefully you're able to see it this time. Um, so in this instance, it's Bond emerging from the surf rather than the uh, Bond girl. It's Bond who's overtly eroticized, and suddenly who's looking becomes ever so much more complicated. I think this this scene kind of shows us a very elaborate uh, elaborate set the shifting points of view. So it's kind of confusing for us to work out whether we're seeing Bond through the eyes of the Bond girl or not. Are we seeing Bond through the eyes of the mysterious stranger on the balcony? Are we seeing the eyes of the assumed male audience, the majority male audience? And of course, I'm making an assumption there. So suddenly we find ourselves in a much more ambiguous world, admiring, or desiring, or some combination of both, the lovely Daniel in his leperless swimming trunks that became a sensation and a controversy. So I'm arguing that this is the exact moment that Daniel Craig shifted from being an actor into the domain of the sex symbol. And this illustrates the kind of precarious position of the male sex symbol. Henry Cartier-Bresson, uh, Bresson, the photographer, talked about the idea of a defining moment when taking a photograph that is almost impossible to describe in, in, in words. And I'm arguing that male sex symbols, to a greater or lesser degree, have to have one of these defining moments to assume that status. So the next point that I want to make is that the idea of a sex symbol can be traced back to the earliest days of narrative cinema and certainly further back than the 1950s, the point at which the, the term was coined. And that in terms of actors attracting a fan following based on their looks and sexual appeal, that many of the prominent examples back in the early days of cinema were in fact men. So there's some imprecision here. I'm saying that matinee idol and sex symbol, the terms that were used to describe popular male actors during this period, are synonymous. But and you, I'm afraid you're just going to have to either accept that that's um, a case to make or you'll have to argue with me about that. Now, Valentino is such an obvious example here, part of um, a phenomenon called the matinee idol and also labelled as the, the so-called Latin lover. What Valentino points to is that male sex symbols reflect or summon up fantasies that are particular to a given moment. So ideas that are not fixed or eternal at all. So at the point of um, Valentino's, the height of Valentino's success, these ideas of an exotic Arabia, the fantasy of the not here, the fantasy of the far away, and equally um, the fantasy of the far away fantasy man of romance and mystery. And, and, and this being kind of articulated through the revealing of body, but also the sport, the, the sport in a very elaborate costume, dragging it in, in essence. But Valentino, is by no means the beginning and end of this popularity for handsome and sexy men in early cinema. So um, the Mexican actor Ramon Navarro, 
so much of his iconography and his um, star status is based around physicality and athleticism. His appeal lies in this athleticism and his body is frequently on display. Even though he was often described like Valentino as a Latin lover and he was marketed as a rival to Valentino, in fact, his ethnicity is less prominently foregrounded than his sex appeal. His sexy revealing costumes in Ben-Hur in 1925, for example, created a sensation and you can see him here cracking his whip, showing his um, muscular gams off. He was always in the bath or in a swimming pool, in photographs and films. In actual fact, though, early cinema was really replete with mat matinee idols of all sorts. So the picture was really quite complicated early on. So here we've got Wallace Reed, who was arguably as popular as Valentino and a model of the athletic All-American boy. And we've also here got Francis X Bushman, who was described in his day as the handsomest man in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Another opportunity for you, me to uh, draw your attention to a book. And this is Galen Studlar's The Mad Masquerade, Stardom and Masculinity in the Jazz Age. Now, this isn't a book that it's particularly easy to find in print, unfortunately, but it's excellent. So if you can find it, I really strongly recommend you do um, read it. There's a lot in this book about the, the matinee idols. So I want, now want to jump forward to the 1930s. I think the 1930s in many ways was not unlike now. It was a very um, a particularly body conscious era. And these two images here are kind of central in crystallizing the sex appeal status of two athletes, two swimmers, in fact, who turned film stars. Um, so Buster Crabbe and Johnny Weissmuller, particularly um, this extraordinarily erotic image by uh, Cecil Beaton of Johnny Weissmuller. I'm also contractually obligated to mention Frederick March here. He, here he is in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1931. He's a favourite of a librarian of this parish. I shall now move on. I'm going to jump right forward to the 1950s. I think what, what we can observe in the 1950s is a dichotomy. And it's a dichotomy that is around conventionalism and the challenge to conventionalism. And here we have Rock Hudson, somebody I've written about, um, famously marketed as the Baron of Beefcake and part of a group of young, impossibly handsome male actors who were sold to audiences on the basis of their good looks, their athleticism, their physicality and their sex appeal. And on the other hand, Marlon Brando, the rebel and the hellraiser. So I think this duality of two very separate um, Im imaginings or versions of the sex symbol is something that we start to see um, really kind of uh, concretized in the 1950s, this binarism between the dream boat designed by the industry and the rebel and the excitement that goes with rebellion, which include which include sexual excitement, of course. I just want to pause for a moment, though, to draw your attention or to remind you of this figure um, the really unsettling Yul Brynner. There's a photograph here of him um, photographed by George Platt Lines in the 1940s. George Platt Lines was a, a famous gay photographer. And here we also see him bald and majestic as we're more used to him in The King and I. For me, Jörg Brenner is fascinating in his oddness. And for me, in many ways, Jörg Brenner is the epitome of what's at stake with a male sex symbol. He's incredibly enigmatic. He's cast in ways that illustrate that Hollywood didn't quite understand what he was and what his appeal was. And I think I might actually want to argue 
that during the mid uh, the mid century, the uh, middle of the 20th century, your Brenner was in fact the sexiest man alive. I'm sure that's a statement that will cause some colleagues some thoughts. I can I can let you know there are uh, a good friend of mine, um, Susanna Passan, and he's in the process of writing a book about um, your Brenner at the moment, which is one to look forward to. But here's two books that anybody who teaches film or media studies who might be listening, um, both of these books will be really uh, obvious and familiar choices to you, but they're both a great read for the general reader too. So Steve Cohen, author and editor of both of these. So let's move forward again to the 1960s. And I think in the 1960s, we see a further expansion of the ambit of male beauty and male sex sexiness. And at this point, I think I am arguing that um, sexiness and beauty kind of are conjoined in the 1960s. So these aquiline, androgynous, um, beautiful men who are kind of quite far removed from the burly athleticism of 1950s Hollywood. I think 60s male beauty, as we now understand it, is really kind of epitomised by Terence Stamp and Alain Delon. There's something about the tyranny or the menace of beauty, but also its threat and its ambiguity that, um, that we see in their physical presence, but also in the kind of roles that they were cast in during the 60s. And as the 60s moves into the 70s, yet more ambiguity of the kind of vaguely homoerotic appeal of Redford and Newman. Alongside, as we move into the 70s, the semi-satirical, semi-ironic, macho sex appeal of Burt Reynolds in this famous uh, nude spread in Cosmopolitan in 1972. And here's some more images from the same Cosmo spread. So I've had to miss out ever such a lot of people due to time constraints. So you might ask, where is Omar Sharif? Where is Warren Beatty? Where is Alan Bates? There are lots of people. Um, the 20th century, I think, is, is marked by a very disparate group of men who've been identified as sex symbols, in fact. So in summary, a sex symbol and a masculine ideal, I don't think are the same thing because not all archetypes are sexy. Also, not all bodies are sexy. So Charlton Heston, for instance, was often cast in roles where he was stripped quite frequently for kind of quite gratuitous or unclear reasons. But I don't think anybody would ever claim that Charlton Heston was a sex symbol. Similarly, Schwarzenegger's body is so overdetermined and there is such a focus on Schwarzenegger's body in all of his films. But yet again, I don't think he was really ever marketed as a sex symbol. Being athletic, indeed being pretty, isn't really enough. And the, the kind of humour that I'm, I'm labouring in, in this slide really is that in the film Predator, and both of these stills are from Predator, the Predator, the monstrous character here, was in actual fact played by Jean-Claude Van Damme, who was presented subsequently as a sex symbol in the 1980s. And that's going to lead me in to talking about the 1980s and the next part of this presentation. So, by the 1980s, the idea of a male sex symbol has become part of the popular cultural landscape. And in 85, People magazine used this idea to start an annual campaign to promote the idea of male sexiness. I think it's especially interesting to see who gets chosen during the course of these 35 years as the epitome of male sexiness. Mel Gibson was the first one. And the person who really, who was the inspiration for the campaign, the, the, uh, the narrative goes that there was a production meeting at People talking about uh, Mel Gibson and somebody described him as the sexiest man alive. And hey presto, you have this long running annual campaign. What matters for me though is 
that this um, annual event provides this really valuable archive that's a useful reference point over 35 years. Not, I don't think, of who actually is sexy, but instead an archive of who the editors of this popular uh, American magazine are interested in marketing as such. So I think what's happening here is a presentation of a normative standard of sexy from this moment onwards. So the sex symbol becoming a marketing category in essence. So what can we learn from this archive? Well, let's have a look. I think the first thing that we can say is that the following years, the years from 85 up until now, really read like a list of the most obvious choices in terms of mainstream American A-list film stars. And, the, and they are film stars for the most part. These are the men that are meant to be read as sexy. These are the men whose stardom is grounded in an ideal, an idea of sex appeal. And when I'm saying sex appeal, this is a very broad appeal, not a narrow one. I.e. effectively, this is um, a shared understanding of what sexy is and how sexy works. So it's a real, a, a really normative conception of sexy, very conventional, very vanilla. The kind of the risk and danger of a Valentino or a Brando seem to kind of a uh, have disappeared. It's also very notable that some of the actors who comprise this list of uh, the sexiest men alive had their moments and some have prevailed. And what we can kind of derive from that is that, um, that sexiness and the idea of a sex symbol is kind of temporally bounded, it's zeitgeisty in many cases. So here we've got Harry Hamlin and Mark Harmon. Some people in the audience will remember who these people are. Um, you know, Harry Hamlin um, was in um, Clash of the Titans in the early 1980s and, and, and moved into television. Mark Harmon was ostensibly a, a TV actor. Um, the country singer here, Blake Shelton, who is um, one of the judges on The Voice in America. Seriously, who cares? Will anybody even remember who Blake Shelton is in five years time? By the time I've clicked over onto the next slide, I'll already have forgotten him. There's also something to say here about um, generation, about age. So the oldest person in the list was Sean Connery when he was 59 and Harrison Ford when they were 56 and the youngest was John F Kennedy when he was 27. Now I haven't compared this list to any equivalent list of women but inevitably one has to wonder if a list of the sexiest women alive would ever have included a 59 year old or a 56 year old. I'm not certain. I think there's something a bit retrograde here too, that somehow Connery and Ford's sex appeal endures over decades, even though their sex appeal, their sex uh, symbol status was really very firmly located in the past in both of these cases at this point. The next thing to point out is that it took People magazine 11 years to decide that a person of colour could perhaps be sexy and that first person was Denzel Washington. Until then all of the sexiest men alive had been white and after that it took nearly another 11 years for a non -white, one white actor to be identified in this list and from 2018 onwards every year it's been a non-white performer. So for the past three years. So I think there's something to say there. So the extent to which <coughs> popular culturally determined ideas of beauty and sexiness are not just gendered, but they're also racialized. Um, I think that's something that this little archive of male sex symbols reveals for us. And with that in mind, 
I'd want to recommend this book to you. So this is The History of White People by Yael Irvin Painter. In fact, if I was only going to recommend one book out of the selection, this is the one to read because it places our ideas of whiteness and their connection to ideas of beauty in a historical context in the most fabulous way. Anybody who knows me by now knows what a fan I am of this book. So what can we learn from the people list and perhaps from thinking about male sex symbols more generally? I think the first thing to say is that sexiness is socially, culturally, historically specific. Secondly, that sex symbols, star quality, charisma are not one and the same thing. Not all sex symbols are stars any more than all stars are sex symbols. So it's not just a version of stardom. Sex symbol status can often be fleeting and it can be very hard to define. It's often pinned to a defining moment, as in the case of Daniel Craig emerging from the sea. I think that the men that People magazine try to identify as the sexiest alive are often nothing of the sort because a mainstream publication such as People can't actually countenance that. They're usually just famously handsome men for the most part, often anodyne, often very respectable men. So male sex symbols kind of remain an enigma, the unknowable rather than the known. So to be male and to be considered or understood as sexy is still fraught with difficulty and ambiguity and complexity. Now, I don't know who the sexiest man is alive, so I've kind of drawn all of you here up like the Pied Piper of Hamlin on a false pretense. Um, but based on my own investigations and based on asking friends and colleagues, here are perhaps some of the contenders. So we've got Matthew McFadden here, we've got Ryan Gosling, we've got Tom Hiddleston. So I guess really it's now over to you because I'd be really interested to know who you think is the sexiest man alive and why and whether it matters. And that's me. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. That was absolutely fascinating. Please, yes, do post your ideas about who the candidates are for the sexiest man alive, because it'd be nice to decide it once and for all this evening. Um, we have quite a few questions. May I say, by the way, that I was very impressed that Frederick March's inherent sexiness did shine through there, <laughs> even as Mr Hyde. Um, I, al I always live up to my promises. <laughs> yeah. OK, we have quite a few questions and they're coming in. So um, and I'm sure the suggestions coming in. Uh, Jane T um, and also Brenda have asked, do you think the term matinee idol was used because using because you just couldn't use the word sex? I'm quite, Is it I'm quite sure that's the case? Yes, I'm quite sure that's the case. Using the term sex, sex or sexy would have been almost incomprehensible in, in, in the, the early years of cinema, the years of silent cinema. Though, of course, you know, as um, early cinema historians, and there probably are people in, in this audience, um, will be able to tell you, um, early cinema was incredibly sexy very often. I don't think the term was necessarily an acceptable term. Um, someone anonymous has said, uh, given that gender is being increasingly considered a social construct rather than a biological content, content, how do you think sex symbols as a whole will progress into the future? Well, it's it's fascinating to imagine um, that people's idea of sexiness could change as people are thinking through or or. or at least questioning the bi um, the bi binaristic nature of gender. I can remember in the 80s that um, during the, the new romantic period that the Adam Ant's appeal, for example, was um, an appeal that was kind of grounded in um, the ambiguous nature of his kind of gender identity. I even seem to remember that, that there was kind of a fan follow, uh, following around Boy George that was kind of um, 
Well, certainly, if not Boy George, Marilyn, who was his kind of nemesis, um, was really kind of aggressively marketed as a pop performer based on the fact that um, he was sexy, that he was he, he, he was sexy and gender fluid. So, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that idea um, is a 21st century idea. I think it's an idea that it would be exciting to imagine could properly take purchase during the 21st century. Yeah, I think we're not quite there yet. Just having a sex symbol that isn't marketed towards one gender or the other. But DL says, were they marketing the early 20th century idols to gay men or, or to a female audience? Well, they certainly weren't marketing um, mat matinee idols to a, um, a, a gay male audience when, um, you know, and certainly in Britain until the mid 1960s, be being gay was illegal. So, no, no the, these are men um, whose fan base was assumed to be a female fan base. Andrew asks, was the Hollywood code, I guess the Hayes Code, 1934, was that responsible for future for fewer portrayals of sexy men on screen? Uh, well, well, interestingly, me, me and Nikki were talking before this programme started um, and we were trying, I, I, I really struggled to think of um, stars from the 1940s who would have been identified as uh, male sex symbols and I think one of the things that we both kind of recognised was the second that the second world war may well have had something to do with that um the production codes made a massive difference in terms of the way in which um representations were constructed in Hollywood cinema and the extent to which filmmakers had to come up with creative solutions to get around the, the 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 restrictions of the code i think it's certainly the case that you can see the um the kind of nature of um the kind of lavish display of men's bodies you quite often see in the 1930s does feel like it evaporates and um, re-emerges again in the 1950s i'm not entirely sure that that's true um but in the here and now without being able to kind of point to any evidence or do any research i'm gonna say yes that's what happened <laughs> um Jose A has asked, um, has said his whole life Burt Reynolds regretted doing the um, Playgirl centrefold. Do you think his regret was justified? I think in in terms of um, securing his star status and what he represented at that specific moment, which was a model of masculinity that was a kind of um, that was a confident form of masculinity, a resolutely macho form of masculinity, but a self satirizing form of masculinity. It was absolutely central to kind of securing his star status. So I, whether he regretted or whether he regretted it or not, it was a very important moment in terms of the construction of who he who he was and who he was understood as during that period. If I think if you asked um, if you asked people in the early 70s, um, who would you point to as a male sex symbol? I think pretty much everybody would have said Burt Reynolds. He would have been right at the top of the list. Yeah, it's a sort of humour, isn't it? It's a key yeah. part of his particular yeah. style is that um and, and asked, that's kind of like a compensatory humor it's kind of like um we we can joke about the idea of being sexy but at the same time we all know that i am yeah that's that's really yeah that's explicit um roy says were the sexy people candidates chosen by the readership or by presumably straight white marketing team um People magazine have always been very ambiguous about how the selection process happens. I tried to find that out myself. 
Um, they kind of suggest that there is some sort of polling involved. There is some sort of canvassing of um, audience response, but it's it's never it, that that has never been made explicit. So I think we can be fairly confident that it's it, it's it's a set of editorial decisions, and that's really why I'm arguing that although it's a very interesting archive. A fascinating archive in many ways because it kind of charts um, shifts in tastes, shifts in ideas. Um, what what it fundamentally points to is a set of um, media professionals decisions about who we're supposed to collectively understand as sexy and why. And presumably there are people who are likely to give interviews to people magazine on the subject yeah. I mean yeah they're media friendly yeah. people aren't they yeah um, yeah Waldo Lidecker, yeah. Yeah. Waldo Lidecker uh, well he, he asked first about why there was no place for black male stars and then you immediately posted some pictures of of when black male stars came in Denzel Washington but he just asked why do you think there were no black male stars earlier is it is it about American sensitivity to race and especially white women and black men well, there's a, I mean, the, 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 there's a like a very long and complicated and um, sorry history around ma race in American society and in American popular culture that, that that answers the question already. I think we shouldn't we, we shouldn't forget in this um, Sydney Poitier and the the popularity of Sydney Poitier in in the. The, the the 1960s, but Poitier was the exception rather than the rule. And he really played roles which involved a love interest, did he? Very, very, very rarely, but in terms of, um, I would suggest in terms of fandom and his fan following, there was a very fervent fan following that was based around his, his, um, his physical beauty and his sex appeal. Um, Pamela says, so many men, so little time. Um, I love the talk and I wanted to ask you which era you consider the most exciting for the male sex symbol. Perhaps when did sex symbols represent a big shift in values? Well, I, for me, always the 1950s is um, a fascination and an obsession for all sorts of reasons, because the, the the 1950s is a, uh, a period of huge huge social change but also a period that's often um, described as kind of uh, conservative and narrow and repressive when the the, the, the the picture was always far more complicated than that so I, I mean you know the the, the work that that I've, I've done in my own professional career, the kind of the films that I've written about, the um, the stars that I've been particularly interested in have always been people from the 1950s. And also because the 1950s, I think really, in terms of contemporary sexuality, in terms of con uh, contemporary attitudes towards um, sexuality and physicality, the 50s kind of feels to me as the kind of um, the, the 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 point of initiation for the moment that we're living in now. I've, I've quite often thought that that rather than the the 50s being the distant past, that we're just living in a a very longly extended 1950s. So I get I, I guess the 50s. I'm waffling a bit actually, Pam. Um. It's, we've got someone anonymous has said who makes the decision about who's the sexiest man alive. Well, I'm kind of guessing it's us at the moment. So we've got a few suggestions. Um, someone anonymous said Johnny Depp. Gillian votes for Jensen Ackles. Uh, Jane T. Robert Downey Jr. Another vote, a vote for Keanu Reeves. And Marjorie here has posted something interesting, which I, I haven't seen. Marjorie has said, have you seen the pictures of the Greek Prime Minister and the French Minister of Health getting their COVID jabs? <laughs> yes, they must do it without their shirts on, but it's not that's not one I've seen, I'm afraid. I'm um, certain to look straight after this talk. <laughs> um, someone anonymous, and I always think it's not so much the actors themselves are sexy as the characters they play. And I think that's certainly true, say, Daniel Craig, 
he wasn't particularly sexy in Knives Out, for example. Um, and Colin Firth is, own, is, you know, very, very sexy in Miss Darcy, King's Speech, not so much. Um, oh, Michaela uh, said Adamant. Uh, Alice has said Timothy Dalton. I know he's 73 and I don't care. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Um, Jeff Goldblum, of course. I mean, you know, the research, the 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 fan base, the the kind of fanatical um, sexual interest there is in Jeff Goldblum. He he definitely is somebody that I should have included, but he would never in a million years have been one of the the actors who would have appeared on the cover of People magazine. No, it's not necessarily about handsomeness, is it? It's no. conventional handsomeness. Um, others, someone um, W has said, would you consider Ke Kerry Grant as a as a candidate? Kind, uh, kind of. Well, I mean, cl clearly, in the thirties, he he's. His stardom was based around the fact that he was an extraordinarily handsome man. Um, by the mid 1950s, so by um, North by Northwest, for example, he's still, um, you know, he he he's his immaculate um, grooming and his kind of confident, self assured performance of himself. He is the blueprint for James Bond. So there's a sense in which that kind of sw I, I think really what that's kind of pointing to is um, the kind of fine dividing line between sexy and suave. Would you say that Lawrence Harvey, for example, was sexy? He was certainly a very suave man, but he wasn't a sexy man. I kind of think um, Cary Grant would be considered one of the sexiest men. This is this is quite an interesting example of someone. Uh, Michael's asked, what do you think about the growing popularity of Timothy Chalamet as a heterosexual sex symbol, despite his most popular movie role showing him in a gay relationship with an older man? Right. That, that final slide, um, for a reason that we don't need to disclose in this presentation, I included Matthew McFadden, but in actual fact, Timothy Chalamet was going to be in that slide because I think um, I think Timothy Chalamet really does point to um, a future where I d um, where the male sex symbol isn't necessarily somebody who's got a six pack um, and rippling muscles where, where uh, a sex symbol can be imagined to be um, ambiguous or um, androgynous in some kind of way. I think I think he's a he's a really interesting point. I think what that also points to is um, the connections between ideas of sex and sexiness and, and and generation and i think one of the things i increasingly become conscious of as a, ma a gay man in his mid 50s um right writing about this kind of popular cultural phenomena um that i'm getting old so i kind of have to kind of um re reboot my aesthetic senses on a, a a fairly routine basis. Yes, I think I think Timothy Chalamet is an interesting case in point. Um, Pamela has pointed out that early cinema could be very sexy, and there was even a film called Sex in 1920, which she just mentions that the most popular euphemism was it, as in Eleanor Glenn's it. Yeah. Um, 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 someone said, fascinating talk, thank you. I'm wondering about the idea of men such as Johnny Depp, who's sometimes referred to as a beauty as well as a sex, as beautiful as well as a sex symbol. Um, the difference, what is the difference between these and how is it this form informed potentially by the roles they play? Characters perhaps perceived as, as aggressive as sex symbols. Um, the, uh, the idea of danger, et cetera. Because it's true, because Johnny Depp, he was slightly weedy in his, his early, his early roles, and I was always, I was a bit surprised when I discovered he's actually like six foot and quite big. I think. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, I can. Ne, 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 I mean, there's something about his physicality that always makes you assume that he's a, a short man rather than a tall man. But 
you know that's the age old thing that the actors are either always shorter or taller than you expect them um to be i think i think there is something important there that um that conflating or ro rolling together the idea of beautiful and sexy as if they're one and the same thing is something that i've really tried to avoid doing in this talk but i'm really conscious that i have done kind of fairly frequently and i don't think they are the same thing jeff jeff goldblum is a very good example that the idea of the sex symbol, the idea of sex appeal, and the idea of being beautiful in inverted commas are not not the same thing. You don't, um, yeah. The, 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 there are lots of men who've assumed sex symbol status who are not conventionally, you know, conventionally handsome and, and certainly not beautiful. Um, Diana Reardon's made another vote for Matthew McFadden. We also got a question from Lawrence who says that. Obviously, Matthew McFadden wins this competition, as we knew. But are there sex symbols who emerge from other media, theatre, pop, music, sport, and come to rival film stars for popularity with the general audience? Of, of, of course there are. And the most obvious example of that is one of the people who ended up on people's lists extraordinarily, and, and that's um, Mr Beckham. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, in, in um, by by any anyone's standards, um, David Beckham is a, a very handsome man, and um, his fan following and the the kind of emotional, psychic, sexual investment people have in him, it would be it would be difficult to argue that he isn't a sex symbol. I think for a lots of for lots of people, he's the definition of sex symbol. So. He, 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 I guess, is really the sexiest man alive, or one of them. Yeah, so the pop stars, I'm not sure there's men, there's any male pop stars, big pop stars who would count. We're probably we, too old to know. Though, but we're probably too old, yes, exactly. I have no idea where sort of Justin Bieber or whatever comes in the scale of this. I've got some votes here for Hugh Jackman and Clark Gable. Um, someone's asked, are there any other magazines like people in other countries who do the same sort of things, who do the same sort of list? I'm, 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 I'm not aware of them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, my, my knowledge of Spanish popular culture is such that I would be extremely surprised if there wasn't a list of the most, um, the most eligible Spanish um, entertainers. So, so, certainly Spanish popular culture is really really focused on ideas of sexiness um jem has asked a lot of the men on shown on screen have hair what role does baldness play in the sexiest men in the world and for the hipster huge beards because as well as um your brenner i guess is patrick stewart there is yes. it's a slight oddity because obviously he's not conventional he you know in his heyday he was not conventionally good looking but women certainly went crazy over him and 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 your Brinner, of course. I, I mean, for, for, for me, um, yeah. since since my friend Susanna decided to write this book about him, I've become more and more kind of. I've, 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 I feel myself returning to him, thinking that he, he's an extraordinarily um, unusual person in in the history of Hollywood cinema, and he has. Um, I mean, I've. I don't think anybody would want to argue that he was a, an especially accomplished actor, but he has incredible screen presence and there's kind of like a, a, a mixture of menace and oddness in him that I think he, he is compelling. And I think that it's that compellingness that makes makes him sexy. Um, you know, a, a lot of the people who, who become marketed as sex symbols are kinds of marketed as sex symbols because they have the kinds of signs of health and virility that we understand in western cultures there are there are uh, uh, legible to us so so tans white teeth muscly bodies a good head of hair and so on bruce willis of course um was um you know kind of but that trend and continues to be regarded as a, a very sexy man and is as bold as they come. And currently, 
occupying a bit of a sort of cult status is Danny Tucci. Yeah. Also not very well endowed with hair. <laughs> um, yep, votes for Idris Elba, um, Aidan Turner. Um, there's someone's asking. Ooh, sorry, I've just lost it. You talked about male sex symbols in Hollywood, but what about male sex symbols in the foreign film industries? Um, the current trend in K-pop stars, South Korean pop stars, could be attended, could be interpreted as a new sex symbol. Yeah, I agree. I yes. Yeah, yes, I agree. The book that I'm writing with Clarissa Smith at the moment, we have we're preparing a chapter on um, Korean popular culture, uh, K beauty and K pop, because that is um, an a an area that was invisible to Western audiences until relatively recently. But I think for younger audiences, a lot of um, cultural references uh, uh, are derived from Korean pop culture now. So yes, I mean, you know, for the sake of this talk and for the sake of um, being legible to a wide audience, this talk has kind of focused on um, Western American popular culture, Hollywood cinema for the most part. But that's not to say that the only uh, sex symbols that exist are um, white Western Anglophone ones, not at all. Um, Tanya Horak asked quite an, interest, an interesting question. Do you think the concept of Sexiest Man Alive has shifted in the context of Me Too? I and mean, I'm guessing, for example, that Army Hammer might have been someone who might have expected to be on the People cover, cover and that's not going to happen. Well, one of the awkward things about um, a, a high profile publication like um, People is that they can't redact covers when covers are out in the world. I think I think Johnny Depp was voted twice. He was certainly voted once. So Johnny Depp is perhaps somebody that wouldn't um, people wouldn't want on the cover of the magazine anymore. And people, and you know, in in light of recent events, people wouldn't want to think of as. Um, an epitome or, or the embodiment of sexiness in the same way anymore. Someone anonymous said, what do you think the relationship is between the concept of the male sex symbol and people we find attractive in, every, in our everyday lives? God alone knows. <laughs> <laughs> because I think if you're waiting, I mean, if you're waiting for Tom Hiddleston, someone who looks like Tom Hiddleston to come along and that's what you're holding out for, you're probably going to be out of luck. So. But then, but you know, those people exist. God love them. I think I think be be open to love. Don't be distracted by a, a six pack. <laughs> uh, vote for Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, I kind of go along with that. Is there a relationship between toxic masculinity and an era's sex symbols? Well, as it happens, that's something else that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about at the moment. I think when you look at the the historical evolution of this as a popular cultural phenomenon, I think, or at least what I feel is that what what isn't celebrated um, quite as much as I would have expected was that idea of um, an aggressive and assertive and a hegemonic model of masculinity that repeatedly uh, people who come to the fore or become prominent or become um, or get assigned with the label of sex symbol tend to be people who don't conform to or you know in in, in some cases don't conform to those kinds of um, models of masculinity that we now associate with toxicity in actual facts. I mean, cl clearly there are examples, but I think what's intriguing to me is how often um, sex symbols don't embody those kinds of negative um, role models and archetypes. We've got some, yeah, we've got some really interesting choices, which shows how wide it is, because we've got someone voting for Colin Farrell, someone John Thor in Morse, someone uh, Audie Murphy, 
somebody who's um, somebody who says they're 20, Adrian, who says his 22 year old daughters would put forward Stephen Mangan, who's not someone I would think of, you know, as sexy. Um, but there you go. I'm not the person who decides. Um, someone said, um, as asked, seems to me the movie stars of the golden age of Hollywood weren't toned and muscled as they are today. Yeah. Observations. I mean, that's. Yeah. I I think that kind of goes back to the point that 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 there are there was I was making a couple of minutes ago. There are there are there. I actually think that that's that's more often the case than I would have expected. That that. Um, that being a male sex symbol and being some kind of archetype or some model of um, perfected athletic masculinity, that the one doesn't doesn't map onto the other anywhere near as much as I'd, I'd expected. To be honest, I think I think that's less the case than I would have expected. I think what it what what it points to is that um, the um, the our sexual imaginations, our sexual imaginaries are more creative than um, the film industry might imagine they would be. And I think it would also be interesting to um, to conduct the same talk talking about female sex symbols and to see what whether an audience of men were describing a, a diverse range of women as the embodiment of female sexiness. I just think it would be interesting to know. Um, Deborah has just said that she saw Yul Brynner in his final performance as, as the King and I, the King and I at the Palladium, very much the older Brynner, but goodness me, charisma galore and past the vapours. Well, um, we've got um, we've got votes for Harry Belafonte, we've got votes for um, Colin Farrell, for Elvis, I mean, it's a it's a wide range here. Um, someone says, uh, Dara says, many matinee idol type actors get embarrassed by their beauty um, and start uh, ruining or distorting their good looks, going hairy or taking serious roles. Uh, Tyrone Power, for example, I guess in Nightmare Valley, and Leonardo DiCaprio tends not to, tends to go for that as well. How do you feel about that? Uh, the 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 beauty itself um kind of carries a burden and that 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 kind of points to the fact that um collectively um we have a problem with the idea of male beauty that male beauty is something that um we either well male sex appeal in particular is something that perhaps we shouldn't be talking about um that we should feel embarrassed about um that that we should turn into a joke you know there are a whole set of alibis that enable us to justify or legitimate talking about this at the start of this presentation i'll kind of open this presentation with a joke to kind of um you know to dissipate the tone and to make us kind of feel like you know, it, it it's fine to be looking at this display of male beauty because that's just a bit of fun. I think I think there's so much embarrassment that um, surrounds these kinds of conversations, even now, even in you know the 2020s. Um, uh, Rosalind makes a ask a question about voice. How, how important do you think voice is? Um, I'm completely put off by David Beckham, whereas an indifferent looking man with a great voice is very attractive. It's like the some early matinee idols, the notable one being John Gilbert, did lose their career when sound came in. And of course, Roman Navarro never really had a successful sound career. No, no, because he didn't have a very beautiful voice, did he? Although he's an exceptionally beautiful man. Mm. Um, well, I mean, you know what one of the things that i tend tend to forget about but i've repeatedly been reminded um was the the one of the real appeals of uh, uh, rock hudson as a star was not only you know he was an uh, an exceptionally handsome man and he was very tall and so on um but he had this incredibly kind of sonorous voice he he he, he um 
his 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 team, the the team that kind of constructed him as a star, put a lot of energy into making sure that his voice. Um, there was a lot of work done on his voice to lower lower the tone of his voice, but he has this kind of very sort of um, soothing, deep voice that you know was designed to charm the ladies. I think I think voice plays a really important part. Uh, some suggestion from Robert Mitchum. We've had a suggestion from Barack Obama. Another one for Ian McShane, which I must say I'd probably go for in Lovejoy, but be <laughs> less so Deadwood. But um, Robert Pattinson apparently said that he didn't get into shape for Batman because James Dean was a sex symbol but not muscly. What does this say about the modern male sex symbol and its relationship to the past? I've not seen Robert Pattinson's Batman, so I don't know. I mean, he's not very muscly in Twilight, is he? Um, no, he isn't. Um, he's he, he's still a, a, an exceptionally handsome man, regardless of his muscles. So it isn't kind of like um, he's he, he he was an actor whose celebrity was based on or reducible to his his body. Uh, per se. I think there is something about a, a contemporary, um, a shift in uh, contemporary tastes and an increasing um, distaste for the kind of overdeveloped um, muscular athletic body. I think it's increasingly becoming a cliche because we get to see it so much more often than we used to and i think that's another thing that um that i've become more and more conscious of because um you know what one of the things that i write about is uh, the way in which masculinity is sexualized across media culture and i think one of the things that you've certainly noticed over the past 20 years is how male bodies muscular male bodies are have moved from being um, a titillating spectacle because we didn't see them very often to kind of ubiquitously visible across mainstream television schedules and on screen in cinema. And I think they become a cliche. So I think inevitably, as with all things, there's a reaction against the muscular body. There'll be a, re a reaction against tattoos eventually. Unfortunately, for those people who've gone big on tattoos, that will be a um, that will be a sad day. Yeah, there's someone, someone's commented that um, Jude Law seems much happier now he's a character actor rather than being incredibly beautiful. Though I'm sure many people would think he's incredibly beautiful. Um, I'm going to wrap up there. I'm just going to leave you one comment from Anonymous. Anonymous comment, which is that Professor John Mercer has the sexiest mind alive. <laughs> Bless you. so <laughs> thank you all for coming thank you to john um people will be able to, will be sent a link if you want to rewatch this and you can then look at the meeting chat and if anyone wants to tot up and find out who got the most votes uh, it seems to actually but lancaster seems to have quite a strong following is that um, just those uh, <laughs> voted over and over again <laughs> that could just be one of our friend jose just writing over and over again um okay we we do have um, other talks coming up. Uh, we have a talk coming up on James Mason, who, who I think probably is the strongest contest contender for being a 1940s sex symbol. Since we and we have talks coming up on um, Doris Day, on Audrey Hepburn, um, on Kenneth Williams, not on the subject of sex symbols. We also have talks on uh, medieval buildings. Uh, we have some uh, authors talking about their works. So please do have a look at our website pages, and see if there's anything else you want to book. Um, and thank you all for attending and thank you very much to John. Thanks everyone.